So what if the funders in the room and the nonprofits in the room all just commit to doing at least one thing we just heard in the last hour? What a difference it would make. So we are going to, to close this fabulous um, symposium by offering you a couple of gifts. The first gift is in the form of a human being, and the second gift is in the form of a collection of his work. So let me introduce uh, Richard Blanco. And there's a slide gonna come up, because he doesn't know we are, we're already like connected. So Richard um, is the, was the fifth presidential inaugural poet in US history under President Obama. And so in a moment, I think a slide's gonna sh come up and it'll be a picture of my family and me at that inauguration. So we've been together in the same space before already, Richard. Uh, so he, in, in being that inaugural poet, he was the youngest, the first Latino, first immigrant, and gay person to have served in that role. He was born in Madrid to Cuban exile parents and raised in Miami, and the negotiation of cultural identity and place characterized his body of work. And I love, one of the things I read, like Carl Sagan introduced cosmology into our living rooms through TV and made it you know, part of our, our normal conversation, he's trying to introduce poetry and, it's, and the transformation it can, it can have in our lives and make it accessible to all of us in, in our transformation. So Richard, I welcome you to the stage. Richard's gonna do a poem, give, uh, say, um, offer some thoughts for us, and then he and I will have a short conversation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Karen, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm curious to see where those physical spaces where we've connected, but I'm sure we've been in spiritual spaces all along. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you here today. As you can imagine, this is uh, not a typical place where a poet gets invited, so I, I really appreciate the opportunity, the space uh, to share my work and my life with you uh, in the hopes that it will inspire your work and your life. I really want to see that slide, though. It's such a great slide, <laughs> me and Obama. But anyway, um, we're going to kick off, as Karen said, things with a poem and then have a conversation and close with the poem. Um, as I always like to say, my poems are way smarter than me. Um, so it's a good way to kick off the conversation. This poem um, takes its inspiration from several things. Um, I was trying to, th I was thinking about um, how do we find a common ground? What are those, st those stereotypes that we have created in our country of each other? A lot of it obviously driven by the political, uh, political divide and political rhetoric. So that was one thing. The other thing that led me to think about the Declaration of Independence. But what's more, de what's more important than the Declaration of Independence is the Declaration of Interdependence. This is the other space we need to move in as individuals, as, as a nation. The idea that we're all interconnected, that, that a community is a big ecosystem and it's all connected in some way. Um, I think the pandemic taught us some of that, right? I think we're also unfortunately forgetting some of those lessons already. Um, so it takes that inspiration, uh, that moment as inspiration, and you'll see that the poem is interrupted by phrase, uh, uh, sentences or phrases from the Declaration of Independence. And the third thing was inspired by the Zulu people and the greeting, uh, and their greeting. Um, we don't, they don't just say, um, good morning, you know, in the elevator, all groggy before we get our coffee, right? The idea is that you look someone straight in the eyes and say, I see you. And the response is, I am here to be seen and I see you. Declaration of Interdependence. Such has been the patient sufferance, where a mother's bread, instant potatoes, milk at a checkout line, where her three children pleading for bubble gum and their father, 
with the three minutes she steals to page to a tabloid, needing to believe even stars' lies are as joyful or as bruised. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. Where her second job is serving an executive absorbed in his Wall Street Journal, at a sidewalk cafe shadowed by skyscrapers, where the shadows of the fortune he won and the family he lost, where his loss and the loss, where a father in a cold town who can't mind life anymore because too much and too little has happened for far too long. A history of repeated injuries and usurpations where the grit of his main street's blacked out windows and graffitied truths, where street in another town lined with royal palms at home with a Peace Corps couple who collect African art, where their dinner party talk of wines, wielded picket signs and burned draft cards, where what they know, it's time to do more than read the New York Times, buy fair trade coffee and organic corn. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress where the farmer who grew that corn, who plows into his couch as worn as his back by the end of the day, where his TV set blaring news having everything, nothing to do with the field dust in his eyes and his son nested in the ache of his arms, we are his son. Where a black teenager who drove too fast or too slow, talked too much or too little, moved too quickly but not quick enough, where the blast of the bullet leaving the gun, with the grit and the grief of the cop who wished maybe that he hadn't shot. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. We're the dead, we're the living, amid the flicker of vigil candlelight. We're in a dim cell with an inmate reading Dostoevsky, where his crime, his sentence, his amends, with the mending of ourselves and others. We're Buddhists serving soup at a shelter alongside a stockbroker. We're each other's shelter and hope, a widow's 50 cents in a collection plate and a golfer's $10,000 pledge for the cure. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident. With a cure for the hatred caused by our despair, with a good morning of a bus driver who remembers our name, the tattooed man who gives up his seat on the subway, where every door held open with a smile when we look into each other's eyes the way we behold the moon, where the moon, where the promise of one people, one breath, declaring to one another, I see you, I need you, I am you. Thank you. Thank you. So I invite Karen back up to the stage. Um, for our conversation. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> oh, I walked off without my microphone. Sophia, you've been up and down a lot, right? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there's, can you see now? There's a picture of my family at the, at the inauguration. It was cold that day. Yes, it was. <laughs> cold so, but warm. <laughs> yes. So Richard, I see you. Um, the Declaration of Interdependence. Interdependence is not one of the pillars of Western philosophy. And we're talking about the status quo has got to go. The status quo is independence, uh, individualism, pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps. So how do we move from our current, our current 
philosophy of independence as a United States of America to independent, interdependence. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's exactly right. It actually comes from Buddhist thinking or, or philosophy. Um, that's a big question, but um, I think one of the ways I try to do it in my poetry is exactly sort of what that poem is doing, is to recognize our humanity, um, to recognize that there are real stories behind, uh, real stories, real lives, real peoples, real faces, that humanize these sometimes con uh, concepts or strategies or, um, or, or whatnot that can get really abstracted, right? Um, if you look at even, well, since we can talk about Obama, right? <laughs> Obama in his speeches always brings in a little example of a real human being, uh, a barber that he went to in Cuba. I'll never forget that story. And I think that that starts to break down that kind of stereotype, but also understanding that, that at the end of the day, our humanity is our common ground and that we actually, uh, to survive, um, we need to connect. I mean, besides even bringing in climate change into this into this conversation, um, so I think I think humanizing things um, in 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 whatever moments you can, and not just talking in the abstract, I think is a is a way towards um, towards. Uh, understanding that interdependence. When you see a real life story and what it means to people and, and, and unexpected stories sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Yesterday we had some folks talking about stories mm -hmm. and stories are a way to understand people for whom you think you're, you're not really interested in their perspective. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's happened to me more. <laughs> that's happened, right? Um, and I think it's happening more and more and I try to catch myself. Um, just because someone has a red pickup truck does not mean X, Y, and Z, right? <laughs> um, and because we're, we're just assuming the story behind right. it without really listening mm -hmm. um, and opening the door to that story, not only just telling our story, but inviting that story. And sometimes the story isn't what you want to hear, but, mm -hmm. but still at least there's people talking, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a sense of, of, of connection at some point. So were you, did you decide to become a poet or were you called to become a poet? So a little of both, um, the, the narrative, the romantic narrative is, so I'm an engineer, I, uh, that was my first degree, and, um, and have been a practicing engineer for 25 years. But the, the romantic notion is that, or you know, that my parents made me study engineering and then one day I started writing poetry and the ch clouds parted and the cherubs came down and like suddenly, <laughs> um, but the reality is like everything in life, it's just little small decisions and baby steps and just paying attention, following your curiosities, following um, your intellectual curiosities as well, uh, your creative curiosities, you're just putting yourself out there. Um, and um, I think that applies to any career, any, any, any life really. And so I just started, I just thought to myself, I was working in an engineering office, and I said, what do I know nothing about? Poetry, let's do that. <laughs> so uh, I just carried both, and I always like to say I'm a better engineer because I'm a poet, and a better poet because I'm an engineer, because talk about thinking about interdependence, how language is so important, even in engineering, right? And most, you know, the way our educational systems and the way our, our lives in general are, are, the rhetoric of our lives is that, you know, all, everything is siloed, that this has nothing to do with that and the other. Um, and reality is um, my job as an engineer ended up being 90% writing, communication skills, interpersonal skills, and about 10% engineering by the time I was a senior engineer. So, um, and I love that, I love that balance. You actually are kind of going where I was gonna go next, which is, and this is an assumption I make. My assumption is that a, how a poet views the world and how a civil engineer views the world are from two different kinds of lenses. How do you reconcile that? How are they similar or different? Sure. So um, part of it is craft based. So uh, there's more left brain uh, work in poetry than most people uh, uh, are exposed to. Um, and it's like music. So they say in music, your left brain remembers the lyric, but your right brain rem remembers the melody and it puts it together, another kind of interdependence, I guess. Um, so I found that, um, I found that, that those skills actually overlapped. And again, like I said, in my, as a senior engineer, um, you know, writing and reading poetry is, is also a way of study of the human condition, a study of human nature. 
and a lot of times how to read a room, how to have dinner with the mayor and talk about what the project is about, those kinds of sensitivities that poetry teaches us, that it isn't just about let's get the job and, and whatnot um, and just go in. I think there were some conversations about in the earlier panel, right, like communication and, and poetry taught me how to communicate emotionally as well as be a more effective communicator in, in many other ways. So, mm -hmm. so that was an overlap. But there's another overlap which is interesting. My obsession, because of my biography, um, um, as I like to say, I was made in Cuba, assembled in Spain, and imported to the United States. My mother left seven months pregnant from Cuba. I was born in Madrid, and 45 days after my birth, I, we emigrated to the United States. Um, and I think there is an obsession about a home, place, identity, belonging right, right from the get-go. And as a civil engineer, I ended up specializing in city planning um, and town redevelopment or town development and sitting in a room like this with the whole town and basically asking them, what is home to you? And translating that into brick and mortar, but sometimes two or three years of just communication, again, where the poetry comes in to be able to read people's emotions, people's, what they're, what they're trying to say. So, so there's been a beautiful overlap. I got to start writing poems about some of my projects and would read them in my hard hat at the groundbreaking ceremonies. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Do you use your own lived experience in your poems or observations and understanding of others' lived experience? Um, I would say every poem um, in some ways begins as through a lived experience because even an observation is a lived experience, right? Um, it, I always tell my students, writing a poem is the most arrogant, stupid, selfish thing you could do in the world. <laughs> and then I also say, but it's the most, it is the most generous, selfless, gregarious thing that you can do in the world. Here's what I mean by that. Um, the poem begins with this urgency that you see something or you feel something or remember something. And, and it, poetry, unlike writing novels, begins with this feeling, you don't even know what it is, you just have this, this visceral feeling that this is something that I need to explore. And as you enter the poem, or start writing the poem, the art, the process of the art, the discipline of the art, um, lets you unpack what that, what that feeling is, and not only that, discover something else that you didn't even know was in there. Um, often I'll begin a poem thinking or feeling, I, one thing and in the process of that art I end up realizing it's much more complex, much more nuanced, sometimes contradictory, and that those things that those things can exist and that's actually more true to life. Um, again, I think sharing with all of you here, I think that's a practice we can bring to our lives, to to our work, to anything really, to our engagement with people. Um, so in the end, poetry is about my own transcendence because where I come out at the end of the poem is not the same person where I began at the be where I began it, and I think that happens. That energy is translated to the reader or the listener of the poem. I want to take you on that journey that this this art has 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 taken me on to reach a different conclusion. That poem being an example, I sort of came into that poem like I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it to the man, you know. And I realized, yeah, but that might be just preaching to the choir, which is fine. But what else am I not thinking about? What am I? What am I? What am I skipping? What am I really feeling? Um, what, do, what am I not asking? What am I not investigating? And so, well, you, well, you saw the poem; it landed on that. Mm -hmm. So, once you've completed a poem, and you're different at, at the completion of it than you were at the beginning, and you offer it to us, and we receive it, how do you want us to be different at the end than we were at the beginning? Um, I think I'll say poetry, but I'll also say the humanities in general. Um, I think even in the work, in this good work that organizations like you do and many across the country and across the world, I think we can also, we can also fall victim or prey or get blindsided to facts and figures. Uh, this is the way things are done. Here's a chart. Here's like what we're going to do next. So I would hope I would hope that that poem transforms you into sort of grounding you, first of all, in your own life. Because really, all this work has to be grounded, founded in a real, in a real sense of purpose and mission and emotional, an emotional connection. And that can get really lost in our day to day, in any job, right, or in, or in any endeavor. So I would want you 
I want you to learn something about your life. That's the simple answer to the question. Often they say, once, a, once we finish a poem, the poem is no longer mine. It isn't, it's yours. That poem is yours now to do with whatever, wherever it takes you, whatever, however it breathes in you. Uh, and maybe not today, but maybe you know, next week when you're driving on the interstate, you're like, what is, what is that Blanco said? So that is what ultimately poetry is a gift. Uh, mm -hmm. I see it as a gift um, and, and let, it, let it change. I wouldn't say change is a big word. Let it live, let it breathe, let it ripple in people's lives. Um, and let them have their own personal sort of aha or their own personal grounding in something that maybe they had been ignoring as something that re replenishes mm -hmm. the well. So yeah, this is why I'm doing this work because mm -hmm. it's really about something that happened in my own personal life. It's really something long, you know, uh, really something about my family, really an experience of my community that got me in here in the first place. And so get back into that grounding of, of the, the deepest sense of the self. Um, that then informs everything else. In your own poetry, do you think you've, that there's more power in your poetry that makes someone think at the end or makes someone feel? I think, um, I think both, uh, but ultimately poetry is, the other, I mean poetry has so many parallels with music that first it's the feeling. Sometimes, and this is the problem sometimes with poetry education, um, that we don't allow the student to feel first. They have to think first and then feel second. But the thinking really comes through the emotion. It's kind of like when you hear a song, um, and, um, or even your favorite song, and you've heard it for the 50,000th time. <laughs> In my mind, I'm going to Carolina, <laughs> right? I'm, you know, I'm not from North Carolina. And I am. <laughs> right. James Taylor. Another connection. Yeah, mm -hmm. James Taylor. Um, it lives in me as an emotion. And then there's always a, there's always a thought about, okay, what is home? What is place? Um, well, how am I negotiating where I'm living now? It, and it leads to a thought, I think. So both. I think that's a great answer to everything, both. <laughs> and how much influence of your parents is in you now? Um, so I think, as I said, going back to my origins of already being 45 days old and belonging to three countries and none, uh, it's become the focus of my work and still for many books. Um, I think I inherited a, a kind of trauma that they went through as exiles, as immigrants. I think in some ways my writing was a way to um, esoterically maybe heal them. Um, uh, I think in part my writing was also an urge to document their lives and stories so that they wouldn't be forgotten. Um, and so they still live largely, if not so much in the poetry itself, which has taken another, another dimension of home, the idea of not my own personal sense of home in terms of my culture and my sexuality or my, or, or my community, but really home in terms of what is country, right? What is this big word that we all belong to somehow? So they still live with me. Uh, my mother's still alive, she's 86. Um, and boy, she's 86, but <laughs> <laughs> she might as well be 56. <laughs> she's, still, she's still with me. Um, uh, my, my father passed away when he was young, and I, that's another urgency to tell the story of the man um, that, uh, who he might have been. Um, but they're, they're with me. Um, when I got the call from the White House. Um, I wanted to ask you about that. Like, what's that like? Like, does Barack Obama call you? <laughs> well, I always say he did, but that's just, it's, <laughs> I'm a poet. That's poetic license. Okay. <laughs> you tell the story however you want to tell it. it was, and I, I always think like, you know, my first assignment in graduate school was write a poem about America. And that's basically what I've been doing. By writing about what is Cuban or an immigrant, I've been writing about what I'm, I was like, I felt like saying, don't worry, big guy, I got this one. <laughs> I've been writing this one forever. But, um, and that's part of his connection too in subsequent conversations, right? His own place in this mm -hmm. country, like what does that mean? Why, how do we fit into this narrative? Um, but I get the call, I was driving Massachusetts, and this relates to your question. And before they asked me to write three poems <laughs> in three weeks, basically, um, and uh, before sheer panic or terror set in, I was just overcome with a deep sense of gratitude. 
uh, not for this great moment for me, but realizing that all the sacrifices, all the decisions that my parents and grandparents made, their insistence on education. We lived in Miami. We didn't put on the air conditioning so we could have a little bit of a better education and go to parochial school. That all those little decisions, all those decisions made me who I am. And I, even thinking back on it now, I get a little misty, and I had to pull over the side of the road and just just started bawling. And it felt like the sense of, you know, we, I guess it gets back to grounding in the self, right? We think, I've, you know, I'm a poet. I'm at this point 44. I'm like, you know, I'm Richard Blanco. I've done my life. I picked my major or majors. <laughs> and we don't realize that most, that so much of our lives, right, are scripted already by the choices that are made mm -hmm. for us. Um, um, some good, some bad, but nonetheless choices. And that we come in on the fifth act and that our job is also to take that story, finish it, and pass it, or not finish it, but continue it and mm -hmm. pass it on to others. Um, and those questions we had, some of the questions we answered, um, some new questions that have come up for us. So um, they live with me still, yeah. Could you enjoy that in the moment? Or was it completely overwhelming and you didn't even know where you were? Yeah. Um, no, I really, it was really, it was an amazing moment, and I wasn't as as nervous or terrified as I thought I would be. Part of what's happening is you're sitting on that stage um, at the platform, and you're realizing that you're in the presence of something much larger than yourself, um, much larger than President Obama, much larger than Beyonce sitting a couple seats over, <laughs> much larger than James Taylor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are in service to something greater than yourself. It almost felt like a like a religious experience, like a, a spiritual experience. And so the ego abates. The ego says, this isn't about you. This is about, this is about our country. Um, and also this overwhelming feeling. Even, even to that point, I still wasn't sure as a gay immigrant exile kid that, that I quite belonged to the American narrative. I was still thinking, I got to get a Brady Bunch house, you know, <laughs> and all that. Um, but that moment of just understanding the first, a gay immigrant kid is going to read a poem to the entire country. And it's me. And the world. <laughs> and the you. world. <laughs> and it just, it was this sense of, you know, what you were saying about earlier, uh, about a work in progress. I felt this, I finally felt I belonged to American narrative, not, not glossy eyed and all, you know, rose, rose colored lenses, but it gave me work. And I realized that democracy is, um, you know, democracy is a verb, not a noun. We don't have a democracy. We never had a democracy. We work at a democracy every single day uh, in whatever we do. So, um, and, it, and I realized that that little moment was, well, big moment was part of, of that work in progress, writing another chapter, a little chapter um, that I was part of. Um, and yes, we take five steps back forward, uh, backward, three steps forward, et cetera, et cetera. But hopefully we're looking for a story that continues at least and, and, and has something in sight. Um, sometimes it's a rough story to write. Sometimes we don't get to write it. Many people haven't gotten to write anything in that story. And we've got to lift them up um, and make sure they're included in that narrative. So all these things, um, to answer your question, sort of like I was in this other world. And so... Um, do we have time for a little anecdote? Please Just a, a fun one. So there's a sound delay. This is all the way, it stretches all the way past the Washington Mon Monument. And um, I was wondering why the, why the president would take these long pauses at the speech. So as I finish my poem, I hear like, and if you look at the video, I smirk at myself and I thought, don't quit your day job, Richard. Don't quit your engineering job. And then the roar of applause came in, like it's this wave. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it's just, it was a beautiful moment in ways that were larger than myself. And that, that, that didn't, don't get me wrong, I don't have nerves of steel, but it was, wasn't about me at that point. It was about us. It always should be about us. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you'll let me go someplace with you that we haven't talked about um, as a collective but is that are but are huge issues in the Latino community and African American community and that's colorism. You are a light 
complected Latino and could pass as white. What's that been like? How have you experienced that um, in your life? It's, it's some of the work I'm trying to do right now, actually. Um, of course, um, there, that exists in, in Cuban, and I'll speak specifically to Cuban, Cuban American culture. Um, and as Julia Alvarez is, Alvarez is a great poet uh, and, and uh, novelist, as I'm a white woman of color, right? And so something I didn't quite have to negotiate most of my life, living in Miami, uh, but times have changed, and that's one of the things I'm trying to work on as a teacher, uh, bringing in the, the rich Afro-Cuban uh, history that we have, understanding, it's, it's interesting because there's a kind of racism or prejudice that's different in Latino cultures that is a little more stealthy mm -hmm. and can be almost, I don't want to say more dangerous, but can sort of slip really easily and, and be perpetuated without being called out. Um, can you give an example of that? Well, um, for example, my nickname is Negrito. Okay. Right? You know, you know that, uh -huh. right? And it's right. like, that sounds like cute or whatever, right. uh -huh. but like, yeah. We you know, know what that like, means. Yeah. <laughs> or like, you know, um, like, you know, like when I hear my parents tell stories of about, about Cuba, it's like, um, or something, you know, Juan Negro, Latina, you know, the guy, Juan the black guy. And it's like, well, you know, little things like that. But also there's this kind of, the idea, the, the blind side that, that, that we're not racist because, we, because the, in general, Afro, Afro-Cubans have been more accepted into, for reasons that are historical, I'm not gonna get into, but then there's this invisible, there's this line in the sand that then gets called out. And then, so there's this blind side that's like, no, we're not, you know, we're not those kinds of people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to use the cliche horribly. Most, I have a lot of black friends, right? right? The, that kind of thing can get very, very opaque. And so um, I'm trying to do work with the community in Miami, which is actually, I think, ready for that conversation because it's been a lot, there's been a lot more Afro-Cuban um, immigration exiles come into the picture, a lot of younger people. Um, and I'm trying to do some work with that um, to get us to have that conversation. Um. And along that same line, I know a lot of organizations, a lot of folks in, the, in this audience are trying to figure out how to address just the insidious things that may be happening inside their own organization. And, and we have a group of uh, Latinas here who uh, are, are learning, so we, we use a lot of terminology, so they didn't understand the term microaggression. Right. But when we explained what it was, we was like, oh yeah, you know, oh, yeah, we got that. <laughs> We've had that. <laughs> um, and so, have you experienced that when people don't know who you are? The difference between how you're treated when they don't know who you are and, who, and when they know who you are? Yeah, um, that happens um, in, in more than one context, but I wanna say one of those other, I'm not sure it's so micro, but you know, the saying is, but um, when someone's getting married, if they're lighter skin, they're like, but mejor la raza, they're gonna improve the race. And like, oh. and it's like, ha 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 ha. But it's like, we should not be laughing at this, folks. <laughs> this is more than a microaggression. But um, I'll give you another context. This is with, with, as a gay man, that happens as well. Um, when people don't know who I am or I am, and when you choose to tell them who you are or not, and um, like, you know, I have to come out every day still at, at the ripe age of 30. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Me too. Uh, <laughs> right? Like you get in a cab and there's, you know, cabby says something about, you know, like some girl on the street, you know, something, something, uh, something sexual. And you're like, oh God, man, do Here I, I go need again. to do this today? <laughs> like again, again. Um, so there's that context. With me, um, in the other context, there's, it's an interesting thing because it's, as, you know, from that passes, so to speak, um, uh, sometimes even in my own communities, um, don't recognize me um, unless I speak Spanish. And then, and then there's this kind of negotiation of do I speak Spanish, do I have that connection, do I not have that connection, um, and um, how they treat me differently, do I, you know, yeah, it's a constant negotiation. Not so much in Miami, but. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to keep reiterating. People think often because um, those of us in the audience that are, are people of color and have reached some level of success as defined by others, that 
all of that other stuff goes away, that we're no longer discriminated against, that we no longer have microaggressions against us. It's like, yes, they still happen. Oh, yeah. Uh, very, very much so. And it, it doesn't, achieving some level of predefined pre success doesn't negate at all the realities of how the, the world sees you in general when you walk out. I, I, the other infamous one um, is so. Um, did you come in a boat or? Yeah, um, that one. Um, How do you respond um, to that? <laughs> I. If you I, can say out if loud. I feel like having a teaching moment, because I also feel like sometimes I like being. And then, okay, okay you got 10 minutes, because I'm going to take you through the whole <laughs> history right. of, of, of that. Uh, so I, and most of the times I feel like the teaching moment, yeah. <laughs> like my, my partner Mark says, or husband really says, don't press the Cuba button. But, um, <laughs> but I wanted to, be, you know, you make me think something that I think work that I try to do within my own communities too is um, in the sense, yes, when you achieve a certain level of success, there's kind of everything else goes away. But I think, I'm, I'm thinking it through here now, but I teach uh, Latinx uh, literature uh, and history, basically, is the same to at, at my university. Um, trying to recognize how we also need to be aware of our own communities and have those conversations um, because there are things that need work still, right? Like we're talking mm -hmm. about colorism and stuff mm -hmm. um, and how, how often we need we need to do some of that work as well as as well as how these communities are also perceived and and mm -hmm. and, and prejudiced against in the larger sphere, but not to know that there's also work for for us individually to do and for us to do with our communities to uh, raise us all up. So. How do you use your poetry in your community? Um, well, I do a lot of poetry readings, but. Um, um, I mean, part of like every poem sort of has like the poem I just read has these nuances and uh, and and whatnot. And I try to not just read a poem, but to have a conversation around a poem, comment on the poem. Um, but besides uh, besides poetry readings um, and a more tangible, um, um, I guess example, uh, I feel like it comes from very personal, but I had little access to the, or no access to the arts or humanities um, because of being working class and immigrant and whatnot. So I, I try to go to schools a lot, um, uh, middle schools, high schools. Um, I try to have, as, as that's why I love a space like this where it's not just, not just reading to other poets, which I'm sure there's some poets in the room, mm -hmm. um, but using the poetry as a way, as a doorway to have these conversations and, and Again, just like the declaration, you know, it depends on, I have many poems. <laughs> um, one of the poems that, that I have um, that opens the conversation for even our communities is, uh, for my uh, Cuban Latinx community is, um, it's called uh, Laz, um, Easy Lynching on Herndon Avenue, which mm. has to do, it's based on a photograph of the present day site of the last recorded lynching of in the United States, which was in 1986, mm. uh, recorded. And um, it talks about how, how we can turn to, when in certain spaces, we can believe that we're not racist or prejudiced because we can live in bubbles. And yet, are you really not? Mm -hmm. And so, and I use that with my community, mm -hmm. and let me tell you, it takes a lot to stand up to that. Um, and understanding that the relationship between Cuba and the United States would be very different if Cuba were 70 something percent white mm -hmm. European mm -hmm. rather than, than Afro-Cuban. Mm -hmm. It would be a whole different conversation. And That's how I feel about DC. Yeah. When DC turns 70 percent white, a lot of things will change. There. A lot of things, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of put a mirror out there and like, Here's the, here's the poem in a different context, but it's a, mm -hmm. so I use the poem as a teaching, not teaching moment, but as a moment mm -hmm. um, for people, again, forget people to think about things in, that they're not thinking about or feeling, or maybe are feeling and just need voice. They just need something. Again, I think the Miami community, there's a lot, especially the younger generation, they're ready to have the, more of those conversations. Great. Are you, would you gift us with one more poem sure, before you sure, head sure. out? Yeah. Um, do you want I'll the, maybe, do you want the, no, I think I, I think I can 
read it just okay. to make it less clunky. Um, so um, this next poem that we chose um, is a little more uh, figurative. So it takes its inspiration from clouds um, as a way of thinking about coexistence. Um, and at first I was like, oh, clouds, clouds are so pretty, you know, like, and as you watch clouds, it's, it's, it's messy, right? And they're not all the same, and um, there's storms, and in fact, I'm dreading the thunderstorms that got to fly out of here today. Um, um, there's beautiful days, there's bad, you know, there's all kinds of clouds, and yet they coexist in the same space. So this is a little bit of a more abstract poem, but ultimately that's the message. How can, how can we, how can we coexist? And I think one of the challenges in general that maybe this poem brings out too is um, in, in a really broad stroke is one of our challenges as we move forward is how do we acknowledge, right, we're this world that's becoming more and more homogenized in some ways, um, this through media, communication, economies, how do we keep those stories and in our individual identity while, while recognizing that we're completely inter interconnected, that we're one, one entity, um, or ho hoping that we can do that. So, cloud anthem. Until we are clouds that tear like bread, but mend like bones, until we weave each other like silk sheets, shrouding mountains, or bear the gales that cheer us, until we soften our hard edges, free to become any shape we imagine, a rose or an angel crafted like paper mache by breezes, or a lion or a dragon like marble chiseled by gusts, until we scatter ourselves into pebbles of gray puffs, then band together like stringed pearls, until we learn to listen to each other, as thunderous as opera or as soft as a showered lullaby. Until we truly treasure the sunset, lavish it in mauve, rust, and rose. Until we have the courage to vanish like sails into the horizon or be at peace, anchored still. Until we move without any measure, as vast as continent or as petite as islands. Flowing into an abyss of virtual blue we all belong to. Until we dance tango with the moon and comfort the jealous stars falling. Until we care enough for the earth to bless it as morning fog. Until we realize we're as muddy as puddles, as pristine as lakes, not yet clouds. Until we remember we're born from rivers and dewdrops until we are at ease to dissolve as wispy showers, not always needing to clash like godly yells of thunder, until we believe lightning is not our right to the ground, though we can collude into storms that ravage, we can also sprinkle ourselves like memories, until we tame the riot of our tornadoes, settle down into a soft drizzle, into a daydream, though we may curse with hail, we can absolve with snowflakes. We can die valiant as rainbows and hold light like blood in our lucid bodies. We can decide to move boundlessly without creed or desire until we are clouds meshed within clouds, sharing a kingdom with no king, a city with no walls, a country with no name, a nation without any border or claim, until we abide as one, together in one single sky. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and thank you for your vulnerability. You know, Richard thought we were gonna just talk about poetry the whole time. He didn't know we were, I was gonna ask him about his life and colorism and all that. So thank you so much for being willing to go there because I think that's um, it's the kind of thing we all need to get used to talking about together. And it, and it can't be conversations we're afraid of. 
So before we close out, first let's bring up, everybody's got their name in the, in the bucket. Okay. There's a lot of names there. So let's see, I'm gonna, yep, just hold it for a second. Oh, wait, here's the winning ticket. We're gonna, we're gonna shuffle them around. All right, deep, deep down. All right, so the first person that gets 5,000 donation to the organization of their choice, I, I'm gonna not pronounce this correctly, Tio Natsen Ryball. Did I say that? Teo Tay Natsen. All right, now so I want you to say it so I say it correctly. Teo Tay Natsen. All right. If you'll just take it back to those ladies, they'll find out where you wanna, where you wanna donate it. Where do you think you're gonna donate it? You know, I don't know. There's a lot of um, good nonprofits where I'm from. I, I worked for um, La Puente Shelter for many years, so maybe them. But okay, excellent. All right. That's one. The next five thousand dollar donation goes to Raquel Galvin. Now she's from Kids at Their Best. I wonder if that's who's getting the money. She said, oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Raquel. All right, then we got for the third, Levi Murray. Ah, from Pueblo Community Health Center. Congratulations, is that where that money's going? Probably not, okay, somewhere else. <laughs> All right, we'll do two more. See, the, the applause gets less as, we, as more people are like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Good for you. All right, now we have Kalina Wang, or Kalina Wong. All right, Kalina, you know where, you, where the donation's going? Um, I'm not sure. I'll have to think about it. All right. Just thoughtfulness. All right. I'm going to get one that's a color. So if you, if you fill out a white one, you know it's not you. Amanda Jacquison. How many was that, Taryn? Is that five? Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Do you know where you're gonna give your donation yet? No. All right. Who's gonna to promise to come back next, next year? Okay, then we'll do one more. All right, Amy, you have to adjust the payout. <laughs> Oops. Uh, look, look. All right, let me give me that one. Okay, Rosa Marie, uh, Virgil Garcia. Rosa Marie, I think it's Virgil Garcia. Oh, she's gone. So that's this one then. So, so I'm gonna do this one because she's not here. You have to be here to win. Uh, Carolina Ramirez. Thank you, Carolina. Any idea where that money's going yet? I think I'm gonna give it to Una Mano, una mano una Esperanza. So while our board chair, Mark uh, Wallace, comes up to close us out, I wanna just say thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your at attention, for your engagement, for your feedback for the gifts you brought to us and to each other. Thank you for coming out still in a time when there's still COVID. Thank you for being diligent about wearing masks. Uh, we only had the one 
positive COVID test yesterday morning. And um, thank you for honoring, thank you for honoring us with your kind words. And last but not least, beyond thank you to the team that, that put this together for us. So Jacqueline, Colorado Health Foundation team, Lady Kay,